Okay, welcome back to the spring term of Rosie's Preserving School. I say spring, we might just as well continue the winter term, really, it's so cold and all the snow and everything. But this term we'll be looking at quite a lot of different things because we've got more ingredients to play with and there's more coming up. So we'll be learning techniques which you can use a bit later on when there's even more ingredients around, but we haven't got time to actually go through everything. Uh, so it's the classes are more about technique than actual um, specific ingredients, uh, recipes and so on, because a lot of the techniques can be applied to, to different things. So uh, it's best to start with the techniques. But tonight we're going to be making uh, everyday brown sauce, which is very much like the familiar brown sauce that we all know and love. Uh, and I'm going to crack on straight away with making this because it will take a little while to cook. And while it's cooking, I can then tell you all the relevant details. Uh, Karis is asking, she couldn't get hold of turnip, could she use swede instead? I probably wouldn't, Karis, I'd use, because it's quite a distinctive flavour. I mean, a turnip is sort of just, it's sort of a filler, really. Uh, you can use extra of the other ingredients. It's only 250 grams of turnip. I actually happen to have some because we grew some in our raised beds for the tops for the chickens during the winter to give them some greens. So I actually did have some, but other than that, I wouldn't have been able to get any at this time of year. But if you're making this later on in late summer, you'll probably, you know, be able to get them quite easily. And they're a good sort of bulker out, you know, they pad everything out and, uh, but, but take on the flavors of, of the spices and all the other things. So uh, it's a good economic recipe really. So on my table here, I've already uh, prepped most of it because you don't want to watch me just chopping vegetables all evening. So I've got some white cabbage, which is 500 grams, I think, white cabbage. Yes, 500 grams of white cabbage. I've got some onion, which is 250 grams, 250 grams of carrots. I've got uh, the turnip, which is um, 250 grams, there's some garlic in there. And I'm also going to, when I've got a bit of room in a minute, uh, chop a, an apple, that's 250 grams, and some stem ginger, which I've already peeled, but I'm going to chop up. Now, we're going to cook this. I have cut, cut it fairly small so that they will cook down in the time that we've got. But you don't need to go mad prepping it because it's all going to go through a processor to make the actual sauce which will do a lot of the chopping for you. If you don't have a processor, then you can, as I used to do, put it through a sieve, but it's a back-breaking job and it takes forever. Um, so if you can, I'd, I'd put it through a machine, it's much easier. So I've got some vinegar here. Now this is distilled uh, malt vinegar, which is the clear vinegar. I think it's only that because it's such an old recipe when I was young, you could only get malt vinegar or distilled malt vinegar and distilled malt vinegar was sort of a bit posher than malt vinegar, which was just every day. And I mean, if you've got cider vinegar or even uh, a red wine vinegar would be all right. Uh, we'll talk about vinegars in a minute when uh, this is cooking, but I've stuck with the recipe, which is distilled malt. So I'm going to put that into my pan just so everything doesn't stick. I'm going to put the heat on, get some heat up into it. This is going to be one of those evenings where it's going to, the vinegar is going to catch me and I'm going to keep coughing or something. And then I'm going to put uh, all this veg in. I won't be quite so brave as to pick the whole thing up and it will all end up on the floor. So we've got very cheap ingredients here, white cabbage, um, and I've halved the recipe for you. I would normally make twice as much as this if I'm going to put some in my shop, but um, really we don't need to be making industrial quantities. So this is sort of a good quantity to make. So that's all gone in. I'm going to chop the um, stem ginger. 
again, you can just roughly chop it. You don't have to do anything special because it will go through the blender. Use fresh ginger when you can, because it, it is just so lovely. Um, you know, powdered dried ginger is all right, but um, if you haven't got anything else, but use it when, when at all possible. And of course, we're going to be making preserved stem ginger, not next week, but the week after. So we'll be doing a lot of ginger. So that can go in there. Now my, oh, I better do the apple before I forget it. Now you know how I like to cut the apple. Oh, look at that, <laughs> look perfectly all right. I've got some more, I'll get another one. But, uh, Try again. It's okay. So I cut it in half. I cut it round, avoiding the core into segments. You don't have to do this. I've just found over the years it's easier. And then you end up with one piece with all the core on it, which you can just slice down and take it out. And then each piece, you can run the knife down quite close. So you just take off a very thin strip of peel. Now, as we go through the year, there's a little bit of core there. As we go through the year, you'll be seeing me use the peel for other things. But at the moment, I've got quite enough to do without uh, getting involved in all that. And really one cooking apple, it's not enough to worry about. It's when we get into the apple season and we're using lots of apples. So once you've cut down the peel, you can then just slice across really quickly, keeping your fingers out of the way. My hands aren't very big and I do find holding a whole apple, trying to run, go around with a peeler or a knife, it's just, I end up cutting myself. So I just learnt that way, which is easier for me, but you do whatever you're comfortable with. There aren't really any rules um, for preserving. It's all, all very relaxed. We're preserving what there is, not kind of making a big hoo-ha about recipes and things. So let's stir that in a bit. Is this on? Yes, it is. <laughs> Do not put your hand on the hot plate to see if it's on. Round again. Take out the core. There's very little apple left on there. If you do about, depends on the size of the apple, but if you do five or six pieces, you can just run the knife down once. You don't have to keep on going back to do another little bit that you've left behind. As I said before, I'm no chef. I haven't got chefy knife skills or anything. There's no, there's no need to worry about that. And I, I, my heart's in my mouth a lot when I'm watching them on the television. You, you just think there's going to be some sort of finger in the, in the pie by the time they've finished. But, uh, there we go. That's that. I've got a lemon, nice lemon there, which I'm going to put the juice of. A lot of chutneys and, and sauces have lemon in them, which helps as a preservative. So I'm not using my electric juicer because I've only got one to do. Need to put that in. These are lovely and juicy, these lemons. That's, uh, And that there's no pips in there, so 
if you've definitely got no pips, but you sometimes get a lot of the pulp around on your juicer, just put it in as well, you know, don't think you've just got to have juice. Now then, guess what I did in the break? <laughs> I bottled the lemon vinegar we were making. So that's how it's ended up without its lemon shells in. And now I'm all ready to go again. So if I've got my big jar, I put in my lemon shells. I've got my vinegar, which I'm going to pour in. And all that colour in that bottle has come out of the lemons. So leave them to soak for a couple of weeks and then you can just tip them through a sieve and you've got your lemon vinegar there, which is great, as we've said, for um, dressings and for cleaning your windows and mirrors. I mean, it's not many, many cleaners you can use in a salad dressing, but uh, there we go. Um, right, so that's all in there. We need to also put spices in and the salt. I'll put the salt in in a minute because I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So if I put it in, I won't have it as a prop. So my spices are uh, mustard powder, turmeric, a bit of cayenne and some black pepper. And then we've got the salt as well. I think that's everything. I'll just check my recipe because that's it. So there's quite small amounts in there. So I put them all in one little dish and I'll mix them up a bit to get the, any lumps out. And then they can go in. The thing we're not going to put in is the sugar. Adding sugar to anything that you're cooking or preserving kind of stops the breakdown of the cells of the, uh, in this case, vegetables. Um, so you want to them to cook and break down before you put the sugar in. Otherwise, you're going to end up with some uh, bits that won't cook down. And really, we want to get this as soft as possible. So that's no, already heating up nicely. So I'm going to put these in. Now, be careful with the turmeric because, as you probably know, it's very good at staining everything bright yellow. So don't spill it on your counters and don't uh, get it on your clothes if you can avoid it she says <laughs> and that gives that a lovely colour and the smell of the spices uh, now these are chopped dates uh, I buy them ready chopped, uh, life's too short, you know, for chopping dates, but you can, if you've got packets of dates and you want to chop them up, that's absolutely fine. So I'm going to put those in. Now there's quite a lot, there's 250 grams of dates there, and that is significant because, I'm not going to put the sugar in yet, but this is the 250 grams of muscovado sugar which will give the very dark colour to the sauce. Uh, but combined, that's what, 500 grams, because the dates are very, very sweet and they will add a lot of sweetness. So you don't want to be putting the typical amount. I mean, normally we'd have at least 500 grams of sugar in what is essentially a chutney. So uh, you've got half the sugar and then you've got the dates as well. And the dates help to give that lovely richness to the to the sauce they also thicken it as well um, naturally you know they are a sort of thickener they cook down and uh, make everything nice and uh, sort of stuck together you know it, it, some sometimes it's difficult to cook down the chutney to the right consistency so that's all our things in except for the sugar and the salt, which I'm going to talk about now, so that uh, we have a bit of a recap.
while the ingredients are fresh in their, our minds, I did run off um, the HP ingredients just to see what was in it. And it's actually very good in some respects, uh, not as bad as some, some things, uh, but their main ingredient is tomatoes. Um, I don't know that that is, you know, it's just what it is. And malt vinegar, the same. They've got molasses, and molasses are a, are a product of the sugar refining industry. They're like muscovado sugar, but in liquid form. And a lot of food, um, processed food companies like to use liquid sugars because they're easier to deliver by tanker, to store in silos, and to mix into a, a big vat of ingredients. So. Uh, I'm not at all surprised. It's it's like it's another name for black treacle, in actual fact. So that's what's um, being added. That's on four. I'll got, keep an eye on that. Unfortunately, the other ingredient they have in there is glucose fructose syrup, which is such a shame, because without if they if you could just take that out, it would be a brilliant product in my book. But glucose fructose sugar, which we talked about, and I will come back to on another occasion is really a, a quite a toxic artificial uh, sweetener or artificial sugar, I should say. It's liquid and it's made from corn stalks, basically. It's got no nutritional benefit whatsoever. What it has got as a benefit is it's extremely cheap, uh, much, much cheaper than using sugar in, in, as an ingredient. Uh, and it's also liquid, and so it adds to the whole um, processing. It does it eases. You, you even find, as I've said before, in things like pizza dough, because it eases everything through the um, processing equipment, all the machinery and everything. But I do think that is a real sort of downer, as far as I'm concerned. It's very addictive, and things that have it in. Um, it makes you want to go return to those things to eat them and, and that's partly as well why they put it in there. It's got spirit vinegar, which I have to admit I don't actually know what, what that is, what the difference between malt vinegar and spirit vinegar is. It's also got sugar as well as the molasses, which is a sugar, and glucose fructose, which is a sugar, and it also has dates, which are also very sweet. It's got corn flour, rye flour, so we haven't got any flours in ours at all, uh, salt, spices, flavourings, which are undefined. If they're under a certain percentage of the total product, you don't have to specify what they are. And the flavourings could be natural or they could be completely chemical based, who knows? Um, I would like to think that if they're natural and, and you could applaud them, that they've missed them, but they haven't. And the other thing in there is tamarind, which again is, you know, a solid sort of um, spice almost, uh, which we haven't got. But so it's similar, but I think ours, you know, it's all completely natural. So, um, you know, go us really, you <laughs> know, it's great. Um, Yes, it's a shame they've got flour in there, really, because, you know, you sort of think you should be able to make it without that. I suppose it's speed and everything else. So that's cooking done nicely. And now it's sort of getting softer. I'm going to put the sugar in now, which is a, a muscovado sugar, which we'll talk about in a second. So that's going to go in. It's got that lovely, treacly, toasty um smell to it and flavor as well always tends to clump together in big lumps so i'm going to just ease that ease those out you can't really sieve it because it sticks to the sieve so and again as soon as you add sugar to anything like this it liquefies the whole mixture. What looks sort of a bit sort of on the side of being a bit dry. Oh, shall I put some more vinegar in? You don't need to do that. You, you just need to put the sugar in. You can see how 
it runny it's become. So I'm going to leave that to carry on cooking. Thing is with making chutneys and sauces, I knew I've done this a lot, so I knew that the the, the 500 ml of vinegar was fine. But sometimes in a in a recipe, you'll have nearly um, double that in the recipe, and it's best to put in some of it and see how you go, because you don't want it all so liquid that you know you, you can't ever reduce it enough. So you don't have to actually stick to what the recipe says. It's all a bit, well, what are the ingredients like? What does the sugar do to it? Do I need any more vinegar? It, just add it at the end if you think it needs a bit more to be a bit looser, basically. Right, I'm going to just clear these things away. Got absolutely everything in there now. Oh, except the salt. <laughs> ah, you, did, you didn't catch me out. <laughs> Right, so we're going to have a little recap on um, our vinegar, salt and sugar because we've got some new people along and it won't hurt to just go quickly go through it again while this is cooking down. So uh, preserving your own food is very, very simple. You start by reducing the moisture content and you can stop there if you're doing things like um, dried herbs or sometimes things like beef jerky and other dried meat. Uh, they just literally hang it up on, on strings across the room and let it dry. Uh, hams and all those kinds of things are air dried and you can do it with fish and all kinds of things. Uh, but the whole preserving sort of world hinges around three natural preservatives. So we've got our vinegar, which needs to be called vinegar to be used as a preservative, and it must have an acetic uh, acid level of 5% or more to be able to preserve food. If it's below that, uh, it, it won't preserve your, your food and you'll get mold and everything else. We use salt and I use uh, sea salt in things. Sometimes I use rock salt and ordinary salt. The, the big bags, the cheap bags you get, I just use for pickling to draw the water out of um, the pickles or the, the ingredients that you're going to pickle so that you can then add your vinegar mix you might have other things in it but the vinegar will then replace the moisture in what you're pickling and the acetic acid will uh, not be diluted by extra water in your cucumbers or pickled onions or whatever it is so you can be sure that it that will stay safe if you don't remove that moisture then you're you're going to end up in trouble and then the third preservative is sugar. Now, this happens to be muscovado sugar because that's what we're using tonight. Any sugar that is actual sucrose is a natural preservative. And sugar is the only, well, I think it's the only product that doesn't have to have a best before date on the bag. And you could keep sugar for 25, 30 years and it would still be fine. Nothing ever happens to it it just stays completely inert and that's its property that it brings to the party when we're preserving. Now we might use these three uh, individually, we might use them in some sort of combination of you know salt and vinegar or sugar and vinegar or all three as we're doing tonight. Uh, they all have great properties which is what we utilize in what we are making. So I can now put my salt in. This is a lovely sea salt. There's lots on the market now. We're very, very lucky. Just choose one you like for whatever reason. I'm never going to dictate to you and say you must have this or you must have that. You can buy the cheapest one. You can get the one that you're loyal to because it comes from where you live. You could have a little taste test and try it and see which you prefer. This is up to you. I, I don't have an opinion on it. 
I just like to use the sea salt because it's nice and crumbly and it hasn't got any chemicals in it. And it, uh, that's the main thing for me. So that's gone in. So we've got our three preservatives in here. We've got our vinegar and we've got lemon juice, which is highly antibacterial uh, and helps to uh, preserve things. And we've got our sugar and salt. So there isn't much that's going to happen to this sauce. Put these out of the way so we can see what's going on. Or you can rather. And it's just sort of cooking down nicely. Now, the thing about making sauces is that really you can start with any chutney. So if you've got an ingredient you particularly like, you can make the chutney and then you can do the processing and end up with a sauce. It's not really a special thing, the sauce. Uh, it's not different from a chutney. It's just got an added um, process in it. And in fact, uh, I love beetroot and I love beetroot in sandwiches. And I've always loved that. You know, we used to have them as kids, but they're a bit... Um, problematic because you always end up dropping a piece of beetroot down your front that's sort of squidged out the side of the sandwich or something. So I make a smooth beetroot sauce by making a beetroot chutney and then processing it. And then you can spread it on the sandwich. You can put in cheese if you want to or, or whatever you want. And it tends to stay where you put it rather than um, ended up wearing it, you know, basically. So bear that in mind, if you've got a particular um, sauce that you like, uh, a, yeah, a particular chutney you like, you can make it into a sauce in just the way that I'm going to show you. So uh, with nothing special going on. Funnily enough though, uh, I make a lot of piccalilli and I think we're going to be making that in the summer. And I thought that would be another good sauce because You've got big chunks of cauliflower and beans and goodness knows what. It's terrible. It's all right if you're eating it as a sort of plowman's or something, but you couldn't put it in a sandwich. And I made the piccalilli and I and I I couldn't sell it. Whenever I went to shows and things, people oh no no they like the chunks they like the bite to it. And this smooth piccalilli didn't go down at all. But I see it's being made commercially now, so somebody picked up on it. But. Uh, So this is going along quite well. It's, I think Trev's coming over with the camera so you can see that it's um, cooking down quite nicely. Nice dark sauce in the background there with the um, Muscovado and the dates. The dates have all sort of disappeared. That's what they do. They sort of melt into things. Um, they make a lovely chutney, you know, in their own right. Date and apple or something like that. Or date and orange I do, which is um, very popular. So really, as long as you get your kind of proportions right, and you can do that by looking at any chutney recipe, you can look at things and think well I've got this this and this I'll make a chutney out of that some you'll like some you won't you know once you've made a few chutneys and we will be making it as just chutney um, you can mix and match you can always take out the spices and put different ones in if you don't like something as I've said before there's no point preserving it because you'll never eat it unless you're going to make something and with the express purpose of giving it away to the people who keep pestering you to, for jars of this and that, which they always do. Don't give them your favourites. Keep those for yourself and give them the things you don't particularly like. So if you've got masses of courgettes or something, you know, make something with it and, you know, give them away. But in the main, I try to make things that I like rather than, you know, just because I found a recipe for it. So the spices in a chutney are not there to preserve it. They're there for flavor. 
And you can massively change a chutney just by the spices that you use. You can change the sort of feel of it. Take plums, for instance. You could make a plum chutney in the autumn with just some apples and make it quite sweet, you know, with a few, some ginger maybe and whatever. But if you make the same chutney later on, or you could make it in the autumn, but flavor it with um, things like allspice and cloves and cinnamon, it then becomes actually my winter warm plum chutney that is in my chutney book, um, which I devised. And it, it, it's, the spices are everything and it just makes it that lovely warm, warming chutney for a winter's day. You don't want sort of refreshing and, and sort of zingy. You want something sort of nice. It's sort of like a savory mincemeat almost, you know? Um, and you can do that. You can swap out the spices and so on. And if you don't like a spice, or as I've said, any other ingredient, work around it, put extra something else or substitute it with something similar. Because even if you couldn't actually taste whatever it is in there that you didn't like, every time you look at it in the cupboard, you'll think, oh no, that's that one with whatever in. I'll have this one instead. And in the end, you'll end up, all you've got left is the one that you don't particularly like. So it's, you know, don't, it's best to start with things that you do like. But if you're experimenting and it ends up not being quite what you thought, it's not very tasty or it's got too much of one thing, not enough of the other, you could make another chutney with different ingredients and then mix them together, empty the, the other one back in the pan and then see how you can adjust it to make it. This is how people came to recipes. Nobody owns a recipe. But it's just a, a, a variation on a theme, really, most of the time. And uh, so you, you can, you can, you know, I wouldn't I always say don't throw anything away unless you've burnt it, because if you burn it, it's sort of game over, really, because it will never taste anything except burnt, even if you manage to sort of scrape it off the burnt bit and put it in the clean pan, it will still taste burnt. So, um you know, just uh, that's the only thing you need to actually throw away. I'm just trying to assess how cooked this is. Because actually I'm going to process some of it. I'm not going to um, do, probably get around to doing all of it because it's just be too boring for you to watch. But um, don't confuse chutneys with pickles either. Pickles are completely different. They're generally speaking not cooked and they must be approached in a different way. But a good old chutney is just lots of veg or fruit. As I say, you could do plums, you can do green gauges, gooseberries, peaches, all sorts of things. So, um, and that is always cooked and, you know, completely safe pickles you need to be much more careful with. If you're stuck, uh, if you're out and about and you see a bargain, uh, which hopefully we will when the weather cheers up and there's a lot more produce about, always bear in mind my recipe site, which is recipes.rosymakesjam, uh, I can't remember. Uh, Trevor put it up on the screen. I can never get the dots in the right place when I'm not actually typing it if I say it it's always in the wrong place um the recipes on there you can if you see a bargain you can swap in and out the ingredients um he's got a calculator on there so if you see a lot of plums say for instance the recipe might be for a kilo of plums or one and a half kilo of plums you could put in there you know, you've bought eight kilos at the market or at somebody's farm gate or something, that will recalculate the recipe so you'll know how much sugar you need, how many other things you need, and you can collect it all before you go home. And providing you've got enough jars and everything, you will have the right amount of ingredients for that recipe. Equally, if you look at the recipe and think, oh, I'm never going to eat all that, just put in a lower amount and it will recalculate it down and so that you get, it all scales it for you, which I don't think I've ever seen 
anywhere else on a recipe site. But it's quite handy. Um, and so if you see uh, a bargain that isn't what's in the recipe, like plums or whatever, just use the ingredients as a guide and then um, you'll be good to go. You can, you can just um, substitute things in and out and uh, you'll create your own recipes. And don't be put off if it doesn't quite work the first time. It, um, as long as it's not burnt, you haven't wasted anything. I say, save those for the ones you're going to give away to people. <laughs> serve them right if it's not very nice. <laughs> so we're getting, with the exception of the carrots, which are probably not that tender, but uh, I think the machine will sort them out. It's pretty, um, it's nice and th it's sort of thick like that. It's, and the cabbage is cooked down, the apple and onions and everything. And it's smelling pretty good. So I'm going to turn that off for the moment. And I'm going to put it on the table just to let it cool down slightly. Because you know what it's like processing something that's boiling hot. The machine doesn't like it because it creates some... Um, the air it sort of seems to expand in it and then you, before you know it you've got it all down the wall if you're not careful so I'll move so I've got a bit more space and that's my recipe which I don't need all right and then the bottles I use my uh the milk bottle from our website it's just such a great bottle for filling, for emptying, for washing. It doesn't get knocked over when it's on the toe. All these tall bottles, you know, it's so easy to knock them over. And, and, and then the necks narrower on them and it's so difficult to clean them. Uh, it's maybe not too bad if you're selling because the bottle isn't your problem. You know, once it's gone, it's gone. But for my use, I like using these bottles for just about everything. Um, cordials and well I don't really use any other bottles to be honest except at Christmas when I'm doing sort of pretty things you know for um, gifts and so on so get them washed rinsed pop them in the oven to warm so they're not too shocked by the uh, heat of the uh, sauce going in but I'm just going to put some of this how are we doing time oh, we're all right so i've got my trusty processor here my very noisy processor i'm going to not put too much at once give it a fighting chance plenty of room and it's got the air vents in the top of the cap so hopefully it won't make too much of a actually I'm going to use put the cloth over the top of that because so I've done it before I burnt my hand on it when uh, it goes on and it goes mad but uh, so noisy bit coming up pan here I think what I'm going to do as I've you know I'm sort of slightly shy of the cooking time really because um, I don't want to overrun so what you can do is use a sieve and pour it through just to make sure you haven't left any great big lumps in it you don't want lumpy sauce in your bottles And then you can see how thick it becomes from the processing. Of course, you need to um, combine all the batches 
don't put it straight in the bottles from them from the processor so it's nice and smooth um, because they'll all be slightly different so if you put it into a clean pan and also while you're doing all this bit um, it's cooling so you really need to just pop it back onto the heat to heat up and then pop it into the bottles that's all completely smooth so when if you've got to put this mix through a sieve it's actually very tedious and very very tiring and you do waste a lot because you can't ever get all of it through the, through the sieve i mean this is bad enough and this is smooth Any that. Heat and pop that into the pan because it's it's not only not going through because it's all stuck on the other side, <laughs> as you can see. There, you can see it's nice and smooth. So, I'm not going to do that again because you do waste, you can't ever get it all out of them. So let's do um, another one so that we have enough to reheat and put into the bottles. So you could probably do this in three to four batches. And then you're going to end up with seven or eight bottles of sauce that probably, you know, be almost a, a year's worth anyway. So it's not, although this takes a bit of time, it's not, you know, you're not doing it every week. Well, I might be, but you won't be unless you're selling it. <laughs> right, and again. speed which I will do but it's extra noisy <laughs> Still super hot because obviously, uh, you know, it's not taken very long to do. But if I was doing the whole pan, by the time I'd done it all, um, it might have cooled down more. So I'm just going to pop it back on just to show you what you should do. Don't have it too high because it will pop and go all over the place if you're not careful. So just heat it up, back up to um, temperature. Get your bottles ready. I'll finish this off afterwards. Get the spatula. Uh, Katie saying is cooking time just till all the veg is soft. Yes, pretty much. 
uh, it, you won't uh, overcook it if you leave it for longer. If you need to, if you turn it down and just leave it to to uh, do its thing, it'll be fine. I'm slightly, you know, kind of rushing it to make sure we get it all done, but uh, it depends on the bed, you know, it just, just depends how it... how it cooks down. The other thing I didn't say is that don't over peel things. If the skins are in good condition, just give them a scrub and put them in. It's That's where all the goodness is, just beneath the skin of anything, pretty much. So um, things like the carrots, just top and tail them if they're in good condition and then put the whole thing in. It's less waste and it's, it's good for you. So. You can see it's steaming, so we know it's heating up. I'll put my little funnel. And I'm gonna to have to jiggle the pans about in a minute or two. So it's, uh, Hmm? Um, yeah, you could do, and then I'll, I won't have to hold one and put the other one on. Um, Bottles are a bit more difficult to fill because the funnel has to be smaller and so you just have to be a little bit more patient than when you're doing jam and things. But it's the same rules, fill right to the top. Ooh. So it's nice and thick this. Sometimes you just have to Help it through. Put a little bit more in the top by dripping it in. And hopefully there's not too many air pockets. We don't want air pockets. So I'll just show you with any anything like this, you need to get the air. Uh, out as much as you can so if you just use like a dinner knife or you might have a skewer or something like that and just poke it down and it just releases that air bubble because air equals moisture which can equal mold you see there's more room in the top now by doing that so just top it up right to the top we put the lid on straight away and then as it cools it will shrink and there'll be a gap at the top and that will be a vacuum if you don't fill it right to the top you could get moisture on the cap and on the top of the sauce or the jam. This goes for anything that you're putting in a jar um, like this or a bottle. You, you need to put it in hot, put the lid on, it will shrink, create a vacuum and no mold or yeasts or bacteria can grow in that vacuum. And that way you can keep your, your products for several years really safely 
And when you open them, they probably pop. Uh, they're not button caps, but because you've created that vacuum, you will release that as you open it and it would give that nice satisfying pop. So always fill right to the top. Don't need this annoying little gap that people do mostly uh, because it will keep much longer if you, if you make sure you do it right to the top. So uh, there's your sauce. Um, you can keep it, keep it for two or three weeks to mature. Uh, you can eat it straight away, but it will it will be kind of a bit uh, rough around the edges. You know, it's, it's it's just it will mellow if you keep it. Any chutney is the same. If you keep it, it and the mustards are as well. They just mellow and taste that much better if you leave them just for a bit to to kind of for the flavours to meld. But I'm going to carry on filling these with this that I've already processed. If you've got questions or you want to um, ask me anything, then please do. And uh, next week, hopefully, we'll be doing elderflower cordial. Um, it all depends on whether the elderflowers come out or not. My trees are in leaf and the flowers usually follow straight after. Uh, if they don't, I'll try and get around it somehow so that we just go through the process and we'll have to make it when the flowers come out. I think that would be less of a muddle than trying to swap one week for a different one. We'll just stick to the plan and go with it. So we'll we'll pray to the elderflower gods that they they some they appear somewhere and we can we can uh, use them. But uh, I hope you have a go at this and uh, that it's successful and that you enjoy it.